in the craft, divination is usually very important. We oftentimes use divination to understand a situation prior to casting a spell about it. So many times you can alter the way that you approach a spell or how you word a spell, etc., based on the divination that you cast regarding it. So I always recommend before you cast a spell that you do some sort of a divination on it so that you can get all the information that you need in case there might be something hidden that you didn't understand or weren't seeing before that'll help you to get right to the results much more quickly and efficiently. Divination has as its root word the word divine. And so for us, that means that we are gaining information through divine means. Divine means having the nature of deity. And this is different for us when we say divination than mere fortune telling. Because we are seeking divine answers to our questions rather than trying to force our will on the situation. In order to find the divine understanding or divination, we tend to, if we're smart, link our minds up with our higher self or with some sense of a higher intelligence. Some people will link up their mind with a deity or with an angel or with a spirit guide. But in reality, all you're doing is linking up to your own higher intelligence. I have a linking up meditation as part of a witch's primer, and you can use that anytime you're going to work divination if you like. It's super easy to do. You can memorize the process and then you won't need any recording. But before you do any divination, I recommend that you do some sort of linking up. And then also before casting any spell or working any kind of practical magic, I recommend that you do a divination. Now, a divination usually has to do with the interpretation of some sort of random event. So that can be shuffling of cards, the rolling of dice, the tossing of coins, the reading of candle wax or tea leaves, coffee grounds, any kind of random thing. That's divination. And There are as many forms of divination as you can think of. Anything that's random could be used as divination. You can ask a question and then look up and read the clouds. You can ask a question and read the dust particles. I mean, there's really no limit to what kind of method of divination that you use. And since it's as a result of being linked up to your higher mind, you're being guided and led in understanding the interpretation of those things by that higher intellect. There are a couple of things that are oftentimes categorized as divination, which technically are not divination, but they are akin to divination. One of those is scrying. Now, scrying doesn't have anything to do with random events in the physical world. Scrying is more of an act of pure clairvoyance, and that's where you use some sort of oftentimes speculum. And a speculum can be something like a magic mirror, a black mirror, a crystal ball, a bowl of water, something where you can just lose your gaze. You can gaze into it and lose your physical visionary focus and open up your second sight, open up that third eye and start to see visions. And then those visions you are then going to interpret. Scrying is definitely something we do in the craft, but it's not technically divination, although very often it is categorized under divination. Another form of non-divination that's sometimes called divination is astrology. So reading transits and birth charts and things like that, those aren't technically divination except for in one form. The one form that could truly be called divination is called horary astrology. And at its most basic, in its most basic form, horary astrology is simply a type of divination where you ask a question and then you cast a chart. And then you interpret the, the chart as if it was a person, even including the transits. And the reason why that's technically divination is because it's random. It's all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you're asking a question and then you're going to cast the chart. So that's the only true divinatory 
type of astrology that that's used. So let's first of all get a system together of working divination so that you can set yourself up for success each and every time. And then we'll talk about some of the different methods and how you might employ them. First thing I would recommend that you do is really clarify what you want to know. I would write down your question and make sure that your question is worded in a way that can be answered. Yes or no questions are not often the best types of questions for divination. They can be. There are certain types of yes or no questions that we can ask. But divination, in my experience and in my opinion, shines better in a non-yes or no forum. So how you word your question is everything. For instance, will he call me is not the best question (laughs) for divination. But you could ask what is the true nature of this relationship in my life? Will I win the lottery is not the best question, but what's the best way for me to find financial abundance? You want to set yourself up for success from the gate by, by wording your question in a way that's sensible, that you can actually get a response from the universe that's helpful to you. So asking your question, write it down word it in a way that's thoughtful, that's wise, that opens you up to getting the best possible response from the universe, the best possible answer, the more the most complete and honest and useful answer you can get. One of the reasons why so many times divinations are a problem for people and they don't understand the, the answer is not because of the answer, but it's because they asked a poorly worded question. They, they asked a question that was either not very easily answerable or that was a leading question or something like that. So ask your question very innocently. Ask it very completely. Try to make sure that you're asking a question that can be answered in a way that is for your good. Then the second step is to do what we talked about earlier, and that's linking up to your higher power. Now, linking up to your higher power simply means your higher your higher intellect is going to be taking over the interpretation of these symbols for you. So it's really simply just a matter of grounding and centering, relaxing your body and mind. I always recommend using that orb of light, especially if you are a witch's primer student, you understand how to use that. That way your mind is very clear, you're feeling very protected and safe, so you can really let yourself go and you don't feel like you have to have your guard up. And then doing some sort of a a prayer or invocation where you are calling on that higher power in whatever form works best for you. Some people, like I said, some people work with a deity, with a goddess, with a god, with a spirit, with an angel, or just their own higher self. It doesn't matter really, as long as it's something that you trust and it's something that you feel is going to bring you the absolute truth. And that's what you ask for. Please show me the absolute truth that's for my highest good to know in this situation. No more and no less. Then you just employ your your method. You shuffle your cards, you deal your cards, you throw your dice, you drip your candle wax, whatever it is that you're doing. You pour your ink into the the bowl, you drink your coffee, whatever it is that you're doing that's the random event. Then let go. You let go of your rational mind as much as you can so that you can allow that higher intellect to start to show you and direct you and make connections and say, oh, do you see this symbol here? and how it connects to this symbol here. And within that state of receptivity, that mild trance state that you've put yourself into, you start to receive guidance about whatever it is that you've asked about. And those symbols, you're understanding not only what it says on paper that these things mean, but what it means to you in this moment, because you're being guided and led by that higher power that you've linked up to rather than just going by some book you found. Really letting your intuition be in charge here. Make sure that you have some sort of piece of paper and pen or writing implement so that you can take notes. Or if you're in a really deep trance doing scrying, you could even ask a friend to to take notes as you call out visions and things like that. They can take notes down. 
But make sure that you write it down because very frequently, if you're especially in any sense of a trance, but especially a deep one, you think you're going to remember it all. And then it starts to leave you like almost immediately. I know whenever I give any kind of reading for people, I will lose all sense of what was said. Just sort of like how I lose memory of a dream if I don't write it down right away when I wake up. So I I really encourage you to write down all of what you think you read even the stuff that seems insignificant, even the stuff that seems wrong, just write it down. Just write it all down. You can make sense of it all later. So that's one part I think where people kind of really shortchange themselves is they don't write it all down in the moment. And then they really forget or they misremember what it was that they got. Is some people say, well, it's okay because I took a picture of the reading. Yeah, but that's not the same as what you were getting in the moment by your intuition. You might have been seeing that thing that you took a picture of in a completely different way as you were being guided by your higher power than what you're going to be when you're looking at it after you've closed down your trance and you're just looking at it with your rational mind. So write down, or even if that's too much for you, then put a recorder on your phone or something like that and speak it so that you can listen to it later. I would recommend after you've done everything, shut it down, awaken from the trance, shut down your circle, let the orb of light go, let everything go, and maybe even give it some time, and then come back to your notes later, and then start to assimilate the symbols and allow yourself to make sense of it better. Sometimes you'll get a really clear understanding of it in the midst of that, but sometimes it doesn't make sense in the moment. So if you just write it down and you come back to it later, you say, oh, I get it. I understand what's happening now. Right? If you're not really experienced with divination, don't worry if it doesn't seem like you really got much the first few times. Just practice, practice, practice. All right. So let's look at some of the more common divination tools. Now, cards are very common divination tools, either regular playing cards or tarot cards or oracle cards. Now, the oracle cards oftentimes will have your answers written on them. And so that's sort of almost like a foolproof method. But at the same time, sometimes those oracle cards won't allow you to go deeply enough under the surface. So if you're using oracle cards at least allow yourself in that linking up process to go underneath and see if there's some symbolic understandings that are deeper than whatever the oracle says that that card means. Now with tarot cards, you are going to have a problem if you're not familiar with the deck. So with tarot cards, I recommend that you have some sort of understanding or study in tarot before you start using tarot as a divination tool, unless you're using a fully illustrated deck. I don't, for my own personal use, use those fully illustrated decks because I prefer the, the more ancient decks. But the benefit of using a fully illustrated deck, such as a Rider-Waite-Smith deck or one of its offshoots, is that you can start right away working with symbols and not have to know what the cards mean necessarily. You can just interpret based on what you're seeing in the card as a picture. And in that way, the fully illustrated decks can be really beneficial for divination, especially if you're not very well versed in the tarot. I actually do recommend those kinds of decks for people that are looking to do divination with tarot, but don't have any background in tarot, but they want to get going right away. It's a great way to to get something of value out of your divination. If you're using regular playing cards, there's no symbols. So you're going to have to go into some study and memorization. Um, And it's a worthwhile thing to do, though, because those kinds of divinations, both with the old-fashioned tarot cards and with playing cards, can give you some extremely specific answers to questions. But it does take some study. So you're not going to just be able to, to wing it with a regular deck of playing cards. Now, tea leaves and coffee grounds are very ancient and extremely 
powerful ways of doing divination. And that's simply where you just drink a cup of coffee or you drink some tea. And as long as there's some sort of sediment at the bottom of the cup, and there's many different ways to do it. Some people will put the saucer on top of the cup and then dump it over and then you'll read the inside of the cup and then you'll read the saucer. And there's a lot of so-called rules about it that you you will find depending on which tradition you're following. But ultimately, none of that matters. Ultimately, all that matters is if there's some sediment on the bottom of your cup after you finish drinking your tea or coffee, you can, in that trance state, gaze into that cup and read what those symbols are saying. If you're working with linear time and wanting to make predictions and things like that, you have to have within you some sort of predetermined vocabulary as to what future, present, and past means. So like with tarot cards, very often, just like when you're reading a book, you go from left to right, we'll read things from left to right, and we'll say the left hand is the past, the middle is the present, and the right is the future. And same thing with the teacup and the and the coffee cup. Sometimes down in the, the base of the cup is the future, and up in the middle is the present, and up toward the top is the past, or vice versa, depending on the tradition. In order for any divination method to really have some profundity to it, if you want any profound answers, it's a good idea to to start to develop a vocabulary with your deep mind. So for me, like with my tarot cards, my cards mean a certain thing. Now, other people would read the same spread and they would get a different understanding because they might have different meanings in their mind. That doesn't make mine right and theirs wrong. It just means that if when they're reading the cards for themselves, they need to use their interpretation and their vocabulary, whereas I have mine that I've already established. If you determine uh, what things mean ahead of time, and especially if you continue in that same method over and over again, you develop that lexicon with your deep mind. You develop that vocabulary with your deep mind so that as you practice and as you go deeper and deeper into that method, you have more and more profound and accurate readings. Now, pendulums are extremely popular and very powerful. This and flipping a coin are some ways that you can get yes or no answers. But you need to determine for yourself what means yes, what means no, what means maybe, and what means it's not for you to know. So for me, a yes is is when the pendulum goes in a clockwise circle. No is when it goes in a counterclockwise circle. Maybe is back and forth, like a sh- like shaking my head yes. And it's not for you to know is left to right, like I'm shaking my head no. For me, it's clockwise is yes, counterclockwise is no, front to back is maybe, and side to side is it's not for me to know. Now, with the pendulum, though, I prefer, if I'm going to use a pendulum, to have a type of a Ouija board set up where I have a whole alphabet and some numbers on a board. And I'll show you how to do this on another stream at some point, where I can use the pendulum to spell out answers for myself and numbers, and I can get really specific information that way. And that's what I prefer it for. That and also if I'm doing even simple things like at the grocery store, just trying to pick out fruit that I think is going to be ripe enough, I'll use my pendulum. And and then when I get that clockwise circle over a piece of fruit, then I know that's a good one. And I can do it in a way that nobody even notices that's what I'm doing. And it doesn't have to be a consecrated pendulum. I could use my keys. I could use a necklace that I happen to be wearing. It doesn't have to be, for me, a consecrated pendulum. I can just use anything. Just like I can use a deck of cards that just happens to be on the table that I've never seen before and give it just as accurate of a reading as I give with my consecrated tarot deck. So that's I know that kind of goes against the the grain of a lot of what we teach and which is primer, but for divination, sometimes it's good to be able to just be on the fly and not have to have your tools right? Sometimes you need to be able to get answers. And so I found for me that it doesn't really make that big of a difference as to whether the tool I'm using for divination is consecrated or not. I love working with sand. You just get some, you you can get some sand like from a craft store 
and you put it in a small tray or bowl or something like that, and you close your eyes, and you ask your question, you link up, and you just kind of absentmindedly, as you're not looking at it, just let your finger kind of dangle through the sand and make some shapes. And then when you feel led to, then you can stop and you open your eyes and you start to interpret what you see. Fire gazing, wonderful type of divination. If you have a fireplace or if you're outdoors, you can have a small cauldron with wood. If you're indoors, you could use a small cauldron with Epsom salts and rubbing alcohol, equal parts. And that's a fairly safe indoor fire as long as you're really, really careful. And then just interpret the flames. The, the fire of Azrael is best in a fireplace or in a fire pit outside. You take a handful of the combination of cedar chips, juniper berries, and sandalwood chips, and you throw them on the flame as you're asking your question, and then you read what you see after you do that. Now, if you can't find sandalwood, just use sage. You can just use sage instead. You can use anything, really, as long as you're really clear that you're asking your your question as you cast whatever that material is on the fire. And you'll notice that the, the flames change when you cast that on the fire. And then just interpret the shapes of the fire. You interpret what you get. For scrying, you can use a crystal ball. You can use a black mirror. You can use a bowl of water. If you have like a black bowl where you, that you can fill with water, there's the combo of scrying and divination you can use with something like ink or food coloring. You can have a bowl of clear water, and then I just use a little eyedropper in some black ink, and I just drop in the ink. And sometimes I'll spray some cologne on top of it because it makes it go, whoosh, it makes it go all weird. And then instead of scrying, I'm actually interpreting the shapes that the ink is is showing me. So it's not so much just pure clairvoyant scrying, because in a scrying mirror, you don't want shapes. You don't in, in a crystal ball, you don't want shapes. You want to be able to gaze on something shapeless. But in this case, it's not technically scrying because I'm actually interpreting the shapes that the ink is making in the water or the food coloring or whatever I happen to be using. It's a fun and very, very powerful technique. I love to use that one a lot. The I Ching and geomancy are very popular types of divination. You can just go on and on. There can be any kind of mancy you want. <laughs> Once I did a divination by playlist, and I said, I need to know, you know what, the, what the answer to this question is, and I did a randomization on my playlist on my computer. And the song that it came on, I, I wrote down the lyrics of the opening verse, and the, and within those lyrics were the answer to my question. It was fascinating, and it really worked beautifully. I've done divination by bumper sticker, whereas I ask my question, and then I'm just going to go out, I'm, and this one, you don't want to be in a trance, obviously. As I'm driving, I, the first bumper sticker I see is going to have the answer to my question. So there's all kinds of ways to do it. As long as it's random, anything ultimately can be used as a divination tool. But I recommend that if you haven't tried divination, that you get it going. Because if you are involved in magic, divination is very, very important. And you can use so many different methods, but the goal is always the same, to find out true answers to your questions, and especially prior to doing any kind of magical work. Thank you so much for spending a little time with me today. I so appreciate you. Until next time, blessed be.